All right, so this next guy uh, probably doesn't look like Jason Boothman at all. Doesn't have uh, his hair's a little bit different, but uh, Jason unfortunately is sick and couldn't make uh, speaking. So uh, Nick Johnson's gladly stepped in his place and is going to do Jason's talk. So don't uh, hold back on the questions at the end of the uh, the presentation for Nick. So Nick's head of development research design, and uh, he'll be talking about let go and let the user giving your client the control they deserve. So we'll give it over to Nick and uh, good luck. Can you, can you guys hear me okay? All right. All right. Uh, so as you were just told, uh, this, this in presentation was kind of put together by Jason. Uh, just to give you a quick roundup on Jason since uh, he put this slide in here for me. Uh, Jason is a front-end architect at Research Design. Uh, Research Design, if you didn't know, company based in northern Indiana. Uh, we're about two hours north of Indianapolis. Uh, we specialize in web development and design, e-commerce, uh, Android and iOS development, content strategy, uh, every, basically all the web stuff so you can do. We, we do most of those. Um, Jason built his first official website in 1999 as a senior in high school, and uh, he's been developing an expression engine for about five years. Um, yeah, don't be alarmed if, throughout this slide deck, by the way. I've taken some liberties with some of his slides. Yeah, so uh, I, I've taken liberties with some of his slides. Uh, he, he had the, uh, the incredible foresight to send them to me ahead of time, and I've made some changes. So. So this is uh, some more info on Jason Boothman. Uh, he's married, he's got three adorable kids. He likes Star Trek first over Star Wars, but he likes them both. Uh, hand shot first, avid video gamer. Uh, recently switched from iOS to Android development. Or not development, I guess he just has a phone, Android phone. <laughs> um, and uh, his favorite number is 12. So that's, that's good to know, I guess. Um, yeah, very random. So who am I? Um, so my name is Nick Johnson. I'm head of development at Research Design, like Nate just uh, presented me. Uh, again, Research Design based in Roanoke, Indiana, 10 minutes south of uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, if you didn't know that. Uh, again, specialized in web development, design, all that good stuff. Uh, built my first website in 1998, one year before Jason, as a junior in high school. Uh, I've been developing an expression engine for seven years, so that's, that's two on Jason. And uh, I've been uh, writing code since the early 90s, and I've been doing it for money since like 2003-ish. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about me. Some more about me. Uh, I'm married, and I've got an adorable kid. Uh, I also like Star Wars and Star Trek. Star Wars a little bit more. Han definitely shot first. Um, also an avid video gamer. I did not recently switch from uh, iOS. Uh, all my stuff is on Apple's platform, so can't, I can't escape at this point. I'm stuck. Um, I couldn't be bothered to come up with a fake number that I thought was my favorite. So let's we'll leave that at that. So title of this presentation, let go and let the user colon giving clients the control they deserve. Uh, so. What if my clients don't deserve control? Is a thing that Jason said. I didn't even edit this slide, he wrote that. So apparently this is something he said. Um, so sh show of hands real quick, who has a client that they love and they would bend over backwards to give them everything they want? Awesome, a handful, handful of people. Other, other side of that equation, who has a client that they kind of uh, get the cold shutters whenever they see their name on the caller ID? <laughs> it's like, yeah, most, most people have one of those. Um, so you're not alone. Apparently we this have a video here that's supposed to play. Oh yeah, so is, is he really gonna make me, you know, he's gonna make me do this for every single one of them. <laughs> uh, all right, so. We've all got clients like that. Uh, they're all Doctor Who monsters, apparently. Um, by the way, I apologize. Who, who here likes Doctor Who? Who here is not a big, who's not a big fan of Doctor Who? I apologize to you people. Jason really likes Doctor Who. So there's gonna be a lot of that in here. So 
there's a, there are a few reasons why you might want to give all of your clients, even the bad ones, more control in their content in their uh, content management system. So, one, it keeps your less than ideal clients from con contacting you as often. So you get fewer calls for updates; they can just go do it themselves. Um, it's going to keep your ideal like clients you really like happier because they get to do everything they want to do, and they feel like they're getting a bunch of value add. And ultimately, like a research, we kind of strive to bring as many tools forward to the clients and Expression Engine is a really good platform for that. It's very flexible, there are a lot of really great add-ons and at the end of the day, it, present, it makes a really great environment for just making really easy to use solutions for your end users. So to that end, we're gonna talk about three case studies and they're not really case studies, they're more like uh, really short tutorials on some uh, creative ideas that we came up with uh, that kind of meet these uh, goals. So uh, the first one, we're going to create a client-generated in-page navigation. We're going to create SVG donut charts on the fly. And uh, finally, we're going to create an edit button. It allows, quickly, it allows people to kind of quickly jump from uh, the front end of their website directly into the <sighs> EE admin to make updates. So in-page navigation. So what is in-page navigation? Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's basically you've got a bunch of different pieces of content on that page and you want something at the top of the page that can drive you directly to that part of the page. Um, here's a really quick video that we put together. This is a site that we did for a local insurance company that has in-page navigation. So in this case, client, we were, we were developing a website with the client and the client was really interested in us putting together a, a story-driven website. So we wanted, a lot to have, we wanted to have a lot of like interchangeable content blocks throughout the website and we wanted to make it so that the client could really easily dive from like section to section in a page. Um, but we wanted to give them the maximum control over that page and how it gets built out. So the old way of going about that would just be we talk to the client, we get their needs, and we build a hard-coded page, and we put all the anchor tags in ourselves, and we put all the IDs in place. And you, that's a great solution sometimes. That can be very highly stylized, and we can go crazy with the design, and it can be exactly what the client wants. But on the downside, it's not terribly flexible. Um, it's not forward-thinking or future-proof, so if we ever need to change that page, we have to kind of redevelop the whole thing. Um, clients have no control over it, which is kind of breaks one of our first rules is we want to give the client control over everything that we can. Um, and at any point we need to change it, we have to call up a developer to get it done. So, yeah, Doctor Who. Um, clients usually are not happy with this solution. Um, and they'll say they're happy with it, but eventually they'll tell you they're not real happy with it. Um, Mostly because they have no control, like we said, and every time they need to update it, they have to talk to us to do it for them. So the second way you could do this, and this is also an older way, is uh, you just use a WYSIWYG field. So you can use WYGWAM, you can give the client the ability to get in there and create HTML and create their own anchor tags to point wherever. Um, clients have control over the links and the navigation that they want to build into the page, but it's not terribly customizable. We have to write a bunch of custom uh, CSS rules to deal with HTML instead of a wigwam field. Um, it can be really kludgy and uh, also you, you're kind of forcing your clients to learn how to do basic HTML, which we really don't like to do. Um, and also the downside of it is uh, anywhere you have a, uh, like a, WYS a WYSIWYG field or a wigwam field, um, that suddenly becomes a place where now clients can do whatever they want to do because even though you can go into wigwam and you can lock it down and you can say, you know, these are the groups that I'm going to create. The second the client has the ability to do one place, they're typically going to come back and ask you to give them that access everywhere. So ultimately, clients don't like this solution either. Um, mostly, it's, it's very confusing for them, like we just said. Um, also, a lot of times it compromises our design choices and things that we can get away with. So we found a better way. Very dramatic. Uh, so in our case, the better way here is uh, we're going to dynamically build the navigation using Expression Engine add-ons like Blocks and Stash. Um, this is great because one, it can be highly stylized to your needs. So you can go in and you can develop whatever blocks you need to develop. 
Um, it's easily imp easy to implement. In fact, there's only a few lines of code to actually make this work in the template. Uh, gives the client control over the navigation. So at any point in time, when they're on their published page, they can actually drag those content blocks all around, and they have total reign over what happens on their page, and because we gave them that ability. Uh, and the big the cherry on top here is it doesn't require a developer at any point to make changes to that page, so they don't have to come back to us and ask us for help. Clients, turns out clients really love this as a solution. Um, in fact, as soon as we started using blocks and fluid fields, we really started selling that hard to clients and they really, really like it a lot. Um, it allows them to build in-page navigation while still allowing it to be highly stylized by our front-end developers and designers. And we don't have to worry about anybody learning HTML. So how are we gonna do this? The process. In the Expression Engine, we're gonna implement um, some blocks content fields, page content fields. We're gonna add a, a navigation title field to each of the blocks. So if we want blo a block to have a navigation title, we will give it a field for that. Um, and then we're gonna add some code into our template to allow Stash to collect all of those titles. And then we're going to have Stash again output the list of titles as a navigation element. So this is uh, what the blocks kind of admin panel looks like. Um, if you've never seen or used blocks before, it's a really great add-on. We really like it a lot, and we use it in a lot of the sites we build now. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process to build out different content blocks for the different pieces of content you might want to embed into a page. Um, on any given block that you want to be able to be a navigation section, we just come into blocks and we add a field type for it called navigation title. Um, basically, if a client wants a block on their page to be part of a, that navigation, they just provide a title for it and it'll be available on the front end. So here's a glimpse at some of the code we're gonna be doing. Um, as, like I said, not a lot of lines of code here. It's very straightforward. So first, we're gonna open the block field. Uh, contents uh, slab here is uh, the, typically the name we're calling this particular chunk of, of uh, blocks code. Um, we're gonna check and see if the user has filled out the navigation title. So we're using a conditional here, and we're just looking to see if that title is available um, to us in the template. If it is, we're gonna take that title and we're going to pass the title into CE string. And we're gonna use a parameter of, or a, uh, a mode of CE string called URL title. And essentially it replicates kind of what Expression Engine does when it generates a URL title out of a title. Um, you don't need to use CE string for this. It's a paid add-on. You can actually just do this. There's a bunch of different ways you could do this. You could do it with a, a different app module and there's a bunch of different string manipulation modules. Um, you could do it with an uh, embed template if you really needed to or PHP snippet. Um, so not, not a big deal, but ultimately what we're trying to do here is uh, kind of output an anchor tag here with our URL title and the actual title that we've provided. Um, Next, we're going to take that title and URL title, and we're going to add both of those to a stash list. And if you've never used stash before, the stash list is basically just an array. You, so you can take, during the execution of your template, you can take the values that you're working with and push them into this kind of temporary array. Um, now that the stash has been set up, we still got to dump our content for the content block into the template. So we've added this chunk of here at the bottom with the body tag, and that's just going to take any of the content from our, our content block and put it into the page for us. We're going to parse through the stash list that we created somewhere else in the template. So here we can see we're, we're creating a uh, layout and we're naming it navigation. Um, and then essentially we're just taking that stash list and we're going to loop over it. And for each element that we added to stash, we're going to pull it out and we're going to make an anchor tag. And then a uh, really important part to remember here is uh, we need that process end on the end of it. So what, what this does is uh, stash has a lot of different ways that you can configure it. Um, you can kind of configure where stash runs in the parse order of a template being parsed. By setting it to process end, we're kind of forcing it to go last. And the benefit to here is that um, we're not going to try and output any of this template stuff until Stash has collected all of the possible values for our navigation. 
and the final product, once you dump that into page, you get an, a series of anchor tabs across the top that are generated by blocks. <laughs> and those will hot link you directly to the block in the page that you're trying to get to. Um, some simple things here to note. So um, you could use fluid fields for this. Um, the part of the reason we didn't is we really like blocks and it gives us some more options on the types of uh, content types that we can integrate into navigation items. Um, also, when we orig originally developed this feature, uh, food fields weren't quite a thing yet. So we, we've just kind of been leveraging our blocks code for doing this ever since. Uh, so another comment from Jason, never stop looking for new ways to implement old features. Just because we've always done something a certain way doesn't mean we always should. And that's a really important point to make because the expression engine is so flexible and there are so many ways to do things that if you just stick with the same ways of doing things over and over again, you could be missing out on really helpful and useful ways to extend your products to your clients. So the next tutorial we've got here is SVG donut charts. Uh, so what is an SVG donut chart? Uh, basically, it's basically a pie chart with a hole in the middle. Um, a lot of clients like these, they're catchy looking and they're popular from a design perspective. Um, and they're built out, we're gonna build this actually in, in template with real SVG code. So we did this for a client. Um, they're a small non-for-profit and they needed the ability to have kind of uh, dynamically generated reports on their website and they wanted them to be in the format of donut charts. So we kind of poked around a little bit and came up with the solution that we did. Um, the older ways of doing donut charts usually involved just having a designer sit down with Illustrator and <coughs> create an image of a donut chart for you and you just embed that image. Um, on the plus side, it can be super stylized because it's a designer and, and illustrator and that's a real, that usually can just be whatever the designer comes up with there. Um, on the downside is the clients don't have any way to modify that chart or control it short of asking for us to come along and update it for them. It's not flexible, it's not future-proof. Those numbers change, we're gonna have to replace it. And as you might expect, Clients don't like this because obviously every time they need to update their chart, they have to come back, talk to us and spend a little more money to get that, made, uh, that change made for them. So we found a better, a better way with some help. And the help in, in here is uh, we actually found an article on medium.com where somebody was walking through how you can generate your own custom SVG donut uh, and pie charts uh, with, a little, with a little bit of code. So there's a link to the article um, if you wanted to follow up on it and read it yourself. It's a pretty good, a well-written article. But um, dynamically, what we're gonna be doing is dynamically build the donut chart using a grid field in Expression Engine. And then we're gonna use a little bit of PHP to take the contents of that grid field and stitch together into a uh, kind of dynamically generated SVG image in the page. Clients really like this solution because it gives them the ability to completely customize what the content of their pie charts are. Um, and if you bake this into a blocks, and you, it kind of gives them the ability to put pie charts and graph uh, donut charts all over their site and they really end up liking that. So our process for this example is uh, we're gonna go into Expression Engine, we're gonna create a grid field that'll be able to, to take the data that we're importing. Um, and then in your template, we're gonna pass that grid data into a PHP file. We're gonna step over that content, um, kind of separate it out, we're gonna do some math on it, and then we're gonna display the HTML that the PHP generates. So start, uh, we're gonna do some math, and unfortunately, uh, it can be a little bit daunting because if we're not all mathematicians or we're not used to doing math, uh, it's not super complicated and uh, hopefully I can step you through real quick. But essentially, we're gonna have to come up um, with a base uh, radius for our circle. And since we know we want our pie chart to be roughly, it'll go from zero to 100%, a good starting point is 100. So if you take 100 and you pump that into your pi r square calculation and you do some basic algebra, you can get the circumference of that, which is roughly 16. From there, we're gonna have a, a CX and a CY attribute. Um, and those are gonna be the center of our pie chart. Um, and then we're gonna need to come up with a, with a radius that's slightly larger than our uh, internal radius of 16, which will be 21. That'll give our pie chart a little bit of thickness 
And then uh, we're going to take that 21, we're going to multiply it by 2, which will give you the bounding view box of the SVG. And that's a lot of math. And I'm more of a visual learner. So one of the uh, modifications I made to Jason's slides is I made an image for you. So, oh man, you can't hardly see it. Okay, so the, there's supposed to be kind of a grayish pie chart in there underneath that green circle. But essentially what we're saying is your, circle, your pie chart goes from zero to 100. So the circumference is 100. We know that there's a center point in the center of the circle. That's your X and your Y. We know based off of our algebra that if you've got a uh, circumference of a 100, then your radi internal radius is gonna be 16. And we know we want that, that uh, circle to be a little bit thicker than 16 so you can actually see the, uh, the donut shape. So we've got an outer radius of 21. Since we have an outer radius of 21, we have to multiply that type by two to get a diameter of 42, which will be what your bounding box is or your view box. So the code for this is a, not super straightforward, but it, it, I mean, it's, it can be followed along with if you just remember all the numbers involved. Um, essentially what Jason is doing here, he's got uh, two circles that he's making inside of an SVG tag pair. Um, as you can see, he's got a CX and a CY of 21, so that's half of your diameter. So that's your center point of your circle. He's got a radius of 15.9, which is roughly 16. Um, and then he's uh, using strokes. So basically we're just, we're not drawing like a filled in circle here. We're just drawing the, the line of the circle. Um, so we've got a stroke width of five, which when you add all that up, that ends up with being a full width of 42. Um, you can see here, we're actually making two circles. So we're making a kind of a grayish colored circle and then we're making a colored in circle sitting right on top of it with the same values. And if you did all that right, and you plug all that into your SVG, you get kind of a magenta looking uh, donut shape like this. Um, there are actually two circles here. They're just stacked right on top of each other. And uh, you want to keep in mind, we chose a circumference of 100. But the reality is like that's just to help us make the math a little bit easier. Because it's an SVG, it's going to be scalable no matter where we put it, and we can use basic CSS rules to make it be whatever size we want it to be, or you can set the dimensions of your SVG in uh, parameter form, and you can set it to be whatever scale you like. So next, we're going to take that segment we just made and uh, have it only cover 85% oh, what I do here. I think I got ahead of myself, yep. Yeah. Um, and we're going to use a, a, a property of SVGs called stroke dash, uh, which is a two, uh, basically a two value array delimited by a space. So stro here, stroke dash value is going to be set to 18 or 85 and 15, where 85 is the length of our, of our stroke and 15 is the offset from the, uh, from the end of the stroke to the end of the circle. Um, and since our circle has a value of 100, it's just going to loop around one time. Otherwise, it would just kind of repeat because it's, you're basically setting the, the stroke, the dashing property of a line. So it would just repeat over and over. So uh, if we look at the value of the previous slides plugged into this code. It kind of gives us a code that looks like this. Uh, should end up with an SVG. Oh, he animated this, I bet. Yeah, he did. Um, so given the values of the previous SVG, you kind of end up with this, where you have the magenta uh, donut kind of going around, and then you have a chunk of it that's left out. And it only takes up about 85% of that total donut shape. So knowing that, we can kind of dump all of this information into a little bit of a PHP script, and we can generate donuts now. So this we just need to use the, every time we add a new segment to it, we're going to use the stroke dash array and we're going to add on 15 units. Let's see if this would draw a dash for 15 units. And then, we don't want the segments. yeah, let's say he's getting in here. Well, since we don't want the segments to overlap, we'll just give them a stroke dash offset, which will basically you'll set the uh, stroke dash length and then you'll set an offset on the next one so that they don't overlap. The new segment offset will be equal to the circumference, so all preceding segments will add up to about 100 minus 85 is 15. There's maths, I apologize. 
I didn't go over his math very quick, very well. Um, let's look at the value in the previous slide and plug those into the code. Did I go back several slides here? Oh yeah, okay. I think I got in the loop in my slides here. So let's make this thing real quick. So in Expression Engine, we're going to make a donut chart using a grid field. And so we're gonna essentially come up, we're gonna add a grid field to our channel and this will allow our clients to come in and add all of the different values that they wanna dump into their pie chart. Uh, we're gonna add a text field titled data label and we're gonna add a number field titled data value. We're gonna pass that information into a PHP file and we're gonna use an extension that we wrote at, at Reser called PHP easy, or RD Easy PHP. And essentially what that does is it, it allows us to pass whatever pr values we get from Expression Engine directly into a PHP script. And then that PHP script will do whatever we want it to do and it'll pass back a string. Um, and uh, typically it comes back in string format. It can come back in whatever we're expecting it to. In this case, it's just gonna generate some HTML for us. So inside of our PHP, we're gonna set up an array of colors. So typically, we'll set on the grid a limit of how many segments we want them to have on their pie chart. So here we're, we're setting about 10. Because it's an SVG, uh, we can use any kind of color code we want. So we can use an RGB or an RGBA or HSL or HSLA. Um, you just, all you wanna do is make sure that you provide enough colors to cover the number of segments that you intend to have. So we're gonna put the data into an array and we're gonna loop over it. So here we're, we're taking our table of ours is kind of our extensions way of collecting the values that we pass in via the parameters. And we're gonna explode on those on comma. Then we're gonna loop over that exploded value set and each one of those comma separated value sets will be information about our pie chart, the seg segments of our pie chart. Um, so here we're saying, template, we're getting the label, we're getting the amount, we're setting a segment percentage, we're setting a remaining percentage, and then we're gonna push all of this information onto an array of segments. And then also we're gonna, for each segment we add, we're gonna kind of add up the total amount of, of, uh, of, of num basically like what, the, what the, pr the number for that segment was, we're gonna add those all together to get a final amount that we can use to do some really basic uh, math with. Then once we have that array of segments, we're going to loop over it. And uh, for each segment, we're going to do a percentage calculation on its amount versus the, the total amount that we added up. And then we're going to set here our segment percentage to the full percentage. And the remaining percentage is just going to be the offset of whatever percentage we just calculated. So this code is kind of hard to read. Um, using the segment data uh, we just created, we're gonna build the SVG segments out into HTML. So essentially for each segment now that we've generated and added to our array, we're gonna write out the HTML for that segment for the pie chart. And once we've got each of those segments written out into HTML, we're just gonna build all of the HTML for the pie charts uh, SVG. So here we're setting the kind of the header of the SVG and the footer of the SVG, and we're concatenating it all together with each of the segments that we've made, and we're returning it. And ideally, the final product looks like a multicolored pie chart. So Jason's notes on this is that it's okay to use a previously developed method uh, and modify it to kind of meet your own purposes. And, and this is a good example of, you know, if you need to do something in Expression Engine or you need to come up with a creative solution to a problem, it's okay to crawl around on the internet and see how other people are doing it and then modify it to meet your needs. So last item here, we're starting to run really short on time, is the edit button. Luckily, this is the easiest of the three. Um, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna essentially make a red edit button. So if you're logged into your Expression Engine website as a, a user with the proper credentials, um, when you're on the front of the site, we're gonna detect that you're logged in as that type of user in that user group. And we're gonna display a little edit button here on any page with a content, with a, uh, with a channel entries loop. 
where we're taking that the information and we want to make it available for editing. And uh, we're doing some styling here to make it just a little red button sitting off on the edge of the screen. Um, in this case, we had a client who they had a, a really large e-commerce website with thousands of products. And uh, a lot of times they'll just crawl the front end of the website and review their product data. And uh, periodically they'll find product data that needs updated instead of having to remember what product they were looking at and then go into the back of Expression Engine and search for that product in the uh, you know, channel entry data for that and then edit it. They just wanted an easier way to go directly from the front end of the, of the site to the back end of the site to the published page where they could get to their content. And um, at first, our kind of initial knee-jerk response to this was like, that's not kind of how Expression Engine works. And we kind of thought about it for a while and we came to the conclusion that, that there's a, like no reason that I couldn't work that way. And the solution to this actually turns out to be really straightforward. So inside of your entry template here, so this is any, let's say uh, if you've got a product detail page, this would be the main channel entries loop for that page that has all of your products data. We're gonna capture off the entry ID into a variable. And we're gonna save that out as a layout set variable. So here we're saying the entry ID is, we're gonna set it equal to edit button ID. And we're just gonna make this layout variable that becomes available to us later. Up in your wrapper, um, someplace, we're going to check to see who you're logged in as. So if you're logged, in this case, if you're logged in in a group, uh, group ID one or six, um, which, in a lot of our boilerplate EE builds, one, in, one is super user and six is usually like a client admin. Um, if we find that and our layout, or our layout variable for edit button ID exists, then we're just going to drop this anchor tag into the page. Um, again, this, uh, the logged in group ID is probably gonna be different for every one of your Expression Engine builds, but uh, you can pretty easily look those IDs up. Once you've got your anchor tag in the page, we're just gonna apply some really basic CSS rules here to style it the way we want it to. And this can be styled in any number of ways. So you could style it like we did as a cute little red button off to the side. You could style it as a, you know, entire top of the page, like kind of floating anchor tag or a bottom of the view floating anchor tag. Um, for our purposes, we set it the position to fixed so we can kind of tuck it off off to the side. And then we use some CSS transform properties to rotate it so it was kind of more out of the way and not taking up a lot of screen real estate. And so the final product is we, on all of our product landing pages, if you're logged into the Expression Engine backend, this red button will show up now. And the client really liked the solution a lot. It lets them go directly from that product detail page directly into the backend. Um, like we said, this could also be modified to work on pages where there are multiple entries. You could actually, for each entry, you could actually put a little edit anchor tag on, like, you know, like if you've got a category listing view or product listing view with a ton of products, every single one of those could have a little edit button if you were so inclined. This is just the, the version of it that we needed for our client here. So sometimes great innovations come out of necessity and not a desire to deliver the best product. So this is a, a really good example of making this button was, at first we were reluctant to do the change to the project for our client, but like the reality is like, if you stop and thought about what they were actually asking for, it's a really logical request to have been made of us and doing it actually makes their project a much better project. And that's kind of the end of the presentation. Questions, one last uh, Doctor Who gif for the crowd. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm here for you. Yeah. HTML tables. Um, so typically we will do, um, it depends on how, um, like how variable the table needs to be. So a lot of times we will do those as grids um, and like we'll just kind of program them out to be kind of sideways. So we'll assume that the table has a fixed like, kind of a fixed number of co like columns and then the rows will just be the rows in your grid field. Um, sometimes you need way more flexible tables than that. And uh, we actually ran into this. So an, an earlier iteration of our pie chart example, um, our client actually needed the ability to have extremely variable pie charts and, and also just have that pie chart 
not even be a pie chart. They said like sometimes we want it to be a pie chart, but sometimes we just want it to be like a line graph, or sometimes we just want it to be a table of data. And for those purposes, like we actually wrote a very lightweight expression engine add-on that just takes a like a off-the-shelf JavaScript uh, spreadsheet view and drops it into the publish page. Um, but those are kind of the, the two ways that we've solved it. You, nine times out of 10, we can narrow the scope of what a table needs to be to make it fit within a grid field. Anybody else have anything? No? All right, well, uh, if you go to this URL, uh, this RD URL IO uh, let, let Go 2018, you can get a download of uh, this presentation. So you can get a little bit closer view on some of that small, uh, small code we have in there. Um, if you have any interest in getting that RD Easy PHP module, uh, if you hit Jason or I up on the Slack channel, we could probably get that into your hands pretty easily. Uh, that's Jason's contact info and my contact info. And that's Research contact info.